Amen. All right, we're going to begin reading there in Romans chapter number 4, verse number 1. The Bible says, What shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found? Now, first thing I would point out in this passage, very interesting, is who is he writing to? Is he writing to what we would refer to as physical Gentiles or physical Jews? It would be Gentiles, right? In Romans chapter number 4, verse number 1, notice what he says. <clears throat> what shall we say, say then that Abraham, our father? We're speaking to, why? Because he just got done. Why would they understand that? Because he just got done explaining to them that you're a Jew. And those that are descendants of Abraham are Jews. So he refers to him as our father, your father, and my father. Even though Paul was a physical Jew, he was a spiritual Jew is actually what made Abraham his father. But he says this, what shall we say then? So what he means by that is, now that we know that salvation is by faith alone, and he was just speaking about you know, salvation being, just, the, the Romans chapter 3 is the famous passage known as justification by faith. That it's, if it's all by faith, he says, what shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? Right? And when he says hath found, he's saying, what has he achieved according to the fat, according to the flesh? If it wasn't by works, right? Because the flesh is referring to the works that you do. If it wasn't by works, if it wasn't by the flesh, then what did he find? And then he says this. For if Abraham were justified by works, if he had any way where he could be justified by works, he has whereof the glory. And then he says this, very important, but not before God. Now, what's the only other option? If you can't if you can't <coughs> glory before God, who could you glory before? Before men, exactly. So that's what's referring to. Of course, they, Abraham. Why he uses Abraham, I believe, as an example is the reason why he's called the, the, the you know their father in a patriarch sense. Of course, because he was the beginning of that. But he's also lifted up as a prominent character of great faith and of doing great works. You know, he had great faith, and his faith worked with his works. Wrought with his works when he offered Isaac. So you can see his faith there, but you can also see his work. So he's saying, you know, all the great works that Abraham did, all the other other examples of great works, of being obe of just physical obedience, fleshly obedience that he had according to God's law. What do we say about all those things that he's saying? If he's if he's just justified by faith, what do we say about all those things? And basically, Paul's saying it's great that he did all these things. And you know, if he if he's justified by works, obviously in the sense of man, he can glory, but not before God. That's what he's saying. That's great that he did those things, but that you're not going to stand before God in glory. What does he mean by glory? Boast. What did he just say a moment ago in Romans three? The passage says twenty seven. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. So that's what he's referring to. Glory before God is talking about boasting. He said, and he just got to explain you can't glory right before God. Look at Romans. That's what he. That's the the explanation. That's why he brings up Abraham. He's lifted up as a great man according to the works that he had done as well. For what saith the Scripture? That's a great phrase right there. What saith the Scripture? Before you make any decision in your life, you know what you should say. What saith the Scripture? What does the Bible say? Notice Paul when he's getting ready to prove something. He's like, oh, we can talk about Abraham all day. But what says the scripture? Because that's where you're going to find your answer to the questions in life, to questions that even if you have a question you're studying the Bible, you don't go get a theological dictionary. You don't go and see what the church father said about it. You say, you know, what does the scripture say about the scripture? And that's exactly what he does right here. We're talking scripture in Romans, and what he do, what's he do? He references another scripture. Compare scripture with scripture. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. So he says, for what says the scripture? <clears throat> Abraham believed God, and it was <coughs> excuse me, it was counted unto him for righteousness. Let's look that passage up. So go back to Genesis chapter number fifteen, where that's actually quoted. Genesis chapter number fifteen. <coughs> Genesis chapter number fifteen. We'll begin reading it. <coughs> verse number one. Once you're there, Genesis chapter number fifteen, verse number one. It says this. <coughs> After these things, the word of the Lord came into Abram in a vision. And Abram is Abraham. His name has not yet been changed. God did that a lot of times in the Old Testament when he would deal with man. Once uh, you know, once they were saved and once they started serving God, he would oftentimes give them a new name. <clears throat> he came to Abram in a vision, it says, and then saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me? Seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed. And lo, one born in my, my house is mine heir. 
And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels <coughs> shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven, and tell the stars that thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. His whole point is that they are innumerable. You can't number them. And he's saying, your seed is going to be innumerable. That's the point of what he's saying. Tell me if you can number them. And what's the answer? God took you out and said, count the stars for me. Okay. Not a chance. Right. The answer is they're innumerable. His seed is going to be innumerable. You're not going to be able to count it. <coughs> he says, so shall thy seed be. And then he says, watch this. And he believed in the Lord and he counted it. To him for righteousness. This is the moment that we can see Abraham getting saved here, right? He believed the Lord, he counted it for him for righteousness. I talked a little bit about on Sunday in the morning service in the eternal security, in the eternal security uh, message, about how it's important to explain, because a lot of people, when you say believe in Jesus, what do they say? I believe in Jesus. I've, I've always went to church, you know? I, I believe in Jesus. And what, what, what kind of, what do they mean by that? They mean like they believe that Jesus is God, that he died, that he was buried, that he rose again. Well, let's look at an application here. Let's look at a, a scripture of when Abraham got saved. Is it just that he believes God's real right here? No, it's saying he trusts that what God said to him is true. He's saying he trusts God. He gave him you know, a part of the gospel message, the, what was revealed of the gospel message at that time, and he believed in that, that that would be true and that that would come to pass, right? So again, we can see that it's clearly referring to trust, not just believing or observing a fact, just an intellectual assertion of, yeah, I think that's true in your mind, but choosing to put your trust in that and trusting that. <clears throat> Back to Romans chapter number 4. So it says, verse number 4, now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. You know, it's interesting that he uses the word reward here. It's almost like God knows you're going to look up Genesis 15. And what did it say in Genesis 15? God said, I'm your reward, right? But here it says, now to him that worketh, saying like him that works, right, is the reward <coughs> not reckoned of grace, <coughs> but of debt. What does that mean, now to him that worketh? It's not just saying a person that does good works, right? It's saying a person that's trusting in good works. Just like Abraham was not trusting in himself, what was he trusting? He was trusting in God. It's referring to what you're trusting in. It's saying now to him that worketh, as in him that trusts in works, trusts in the flesh, is the reward not reckoned of grace but of death. So what is he paid? <laughs> is he given grace? <laughs> no, he's given debt. You say, how is that a reward? A reward is... It's just something that you. It's just like a paycheck. It's wages. That's a, a, you know that the word reward can be also wage. Reward like wages don't have people think well wage just means positive. No, it doesn't. For the wages of sin is death. You can be paid something, but that doesn't mean it's good. And right here, what reward or what wage are you given? If you're going to trust in your works, you're given debt. And specifically, what is the debt going to end up being? Where you have to pay for your sins. You have to be punished. You know you are in debt at that point. Uh, we'll read verse 5, and then I want to compare Scripture with Scripture here, something in the book of Romans. And then it says this in verse 5, <coughs> But to him that worketh not, <coughs> but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Keep your hand here and just flip over a couple pages of Romans chapter number 11, verse number 6. And I believe I quoted this in, in when we were in Romans chapter 3, the justification by faith. But Romans chapter number 3, verse 6 is teaching the exact, the identical thing that Romans chapter number 4, verse 4 and 5 is. So Romans eleven six 6 says this, <clears throat> And if by grace, then is it no more of work. So he's saying if, it, if salvation is going to be by grace, unmerited favor, where you're getting something that you don't deserve, then you can't be working for it. It can't be by works also. These two things cannot coexist. And if by grace, then is it no more of works? <coughs> Otherwise, grace... <coughs> Is no more grace. The only way that it can be grace is if you're given something and you're not working for it, right? And then he says after that, but if it be of works, right? But if it be of works, if salvation is going to be by works, you're trusting in works, right? Then is it no more of grace? Otherwise, work is no more work. Thank you. Otherwise, work is no more work. The only way it's by work or works is that you, you know, it's going to only be by works. It's not going to be by grace at all. If you want it to be by works, then it's going to be all by works. If you want it to be by grace, it's going to be all by grace. It can't be both. It doesn't make any sense. Look over at Romans 4 with that in mind again. Verse number 4, it says, Now to him that worketh, watch what he says, is the reward not reckoned of grace. Why is grace not reckoned? 
Because it's by works. Because if it's going to be by works, it's not going to be of grace. It says, now, now to him that worketh is a reward, not reckoned of grace, but of debt. And then watch what he says. Now to him that, uh, now, yeah, I'm sorry, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him, that justifieth the ungodly. Notice too that it says, <coughs> justifieth the ungodly, right? So this person's not working. Let me deal with this verse actually, because I've heard people say, verse number five is saying, but to him that worketh not is saying this person's not doing any works. This is a saved person. They're just doing nothing for God. That's not what that means. This passage right here when it says, but to him that worketh not, compare it to verse 4. What was verse 4 saying when it said, now to him that worketh? Was it a person that was doing works or first trusting in works? Trusting, trusting in works. So in verse 5 when it says, but to him that worketh not, it's not that the person's not doing works. He's contrasting it. Right? He's saying that this person's not trusting in works. He's not saying they're not doing works. It wouldn't matter whether or not they were doing works or not. He's, he's comparing two things. He's saying if a person's going to work for it, as far as that's what they're trusting in for their salvation, then they're not given grace. But the person that's not working for it, as in what? Not trusting in the works. That's And we, we even use that type of terminology. I don't even have to say... You know, I, we say this all the time. You're trying to work your way to heaven, right? I don't even have to say trusting in works. What That's implied when it says, to him that worketh, right? Worketh for what? For salvation. And then when it says, to him that worketh not, what does it mean? He's not working for his salvation. You know, I've heard people try to use this passage to say, as a bolster passage, for saying that the person that does no works at all can still go to heaven, which I agree with. But that's not what this passage is teaching. It's obvious by the comparison of verse 4 and verse 5. It's what they're trusting in, right? And then he says, But believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. So the person that doesn't trust in their works, doesn't try to work their way to heaven, but rather understands they're ungodly and then just trusts in Jesus. So you have the person, you know, this hypothetical situation of them admitting that they're a sinner as well. His faith, so if you have faith, it would be counted or considered, right? Righteousness. When God looks at your faith, he, he sees that you're righteous. Verse number six. <clears throat> Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Now let me say this. <clears throat> I touched on hyper-dispensationalism a little bit in the last chapter. Hyper-dispensationalism, the teaching, is, excuse me, the teaching where someone believes that they are, that people are saved dis differently in different dispensations. There are different periods of time where God deals with man differently <coughs> is a basic definition of dispensationalism. But a specific definition of hyper-dispensationalism, which is dispensational salvation, that's normally what people are referring to when they say hyper-dispensationalism. A specific definition of that would be where God has different covenants in which man is saved differently throughout these different periods of time. Romans chapter number 4 is like a nightmare for a hyper-dispensationalist because he starts off in the very beginning talking about Abraham being saved, which is saved in the dispensation of the promise a lot of them refer to, right? But then you know what he does? He goes from Abraham to David, which is a totally different dispensation. And no, notice how verse 6 starts out. Even as. What does that mean? In the, same way. In the same way. That's a perfect definition of it. In the same way, he's saying Abraham is saved, or David, what he's saying is David is saved in the same way as Abraham. And you know what was tying all of this together? He was, he was tying it in with Abraham, we are saved like Abraham, and now he just said Abraham was saved like David. So it's like your dispensational you know, theology or system just totally fell apart. Even as David also described the blessedness of the man, watch this, unto whom God imputeth righteousness, and he says, without works, saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. And then this is important. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord, watch this, <coughs> will not impute sin. That's future tense. Why? Because as soon as you have faith, you're given righteousness for your faith. Right? So going forward, just like it said in the, in the, the verse before, remember I, I kind of pointed that concept out? He said, to declare, I say it, this time his righteousness. Right? This time we're declaring his righteousness, and he will not impute sin unto me because I'm righteous through him. Just that moment of faith of calling upon the name of the Lord. 
Look at uh, verse 9. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also? So refresh real quick. When it says circumcision, who is it talking about? The Jews, right? Uncircumcision is talking about the Gentiles. So he's saying, come at this blessedness. What's the blessedness? What was the blessing of Abraham? It was the gospel, right? The blessing that was given to his seed, right? <coughs> that promise was given to Abraham because he believed, and then Abraham's seed, and that was the blessing. The promise was the blessing. It was the gospel. So the blessings that come with the gospel, when you believe the gospel, is this only offered to the circumcision only, or is it also offered to the uncircumcision? Right? That's the question he's asking. So he says, uncircumcision also. And then he says, for, because <coughs> we say that faith was reckoned was reckoned or, or given or considered to Abraham for righteousness. And then he asks the question. This is real important. How was it then reckoned? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? And then he says, not it, not in circumcision. But in uncircumcision. This is the concept that he's explaining right now. When Abraham was saved, when you go to Genesis 15, right? We just looked at that. When he was given righteousness, Abraham believed God and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. Was he circumcised himself at that time or not? He was not. So he said it's a poor argument. This is what Paul's saying. It's a poor argument to say that, that you know, Abraham's our father, like Jews try to say, right? Abraham's our father. We're the circumcision, right? When who is their father and who they say circumcision was passed down from, when he got saved and he received the blessedness, he wasn't even circumcised. Right. He's trying to point out how ridiculous that is. And then watch this. This is really interesting. Watch this, 11. And he received the sign of circumcision. So circumcision was a sign. Now he's going to tell you what, the circ what circumcision represented. A seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had yet being uncircumcised. Now notice how he's explaining this. It's very interesting. He's saying, it's kind of like, like Brother Elliot and I were, were talking about this right before the, the service started. It's kind of like baptism, right? To a Bible believer, we understand when do you get baptized? After, right? It would be like if you referred to like people that were baptized and people that weren't baptized. As in two races, right? And I try to say that the people that were baptized were the only people that salvation could come to, right? But the whole purpose of baptism was just like an outward show that you were saved. Well, when it was given the very first time, like in this example, if we go back to the circumcision, the show or the seal, which was the circumcision, it was just a representation that he was saved. So would that seal be given before or after you were saved? So it's impossible, is what he's saying. It's impossible if circumcision itself is just an outward show of that he was saved. It's impossible for him to have been circumcised during that time because it's a seal of the righteousness. That's interesting, too, because obviously we're all familiar with you know, the process of circumcision, and I'm not going to explain that in detail. But let me just ask you this. Is, there any, is, is that reversible after that takes place? No, it's not. So that's why he says the seal of the righteousness. Was it changing? Whether you want to be saved after you're saved, whether you want to be saved in 10 years after you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, is not changing. Seriously, think about that. He said a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had yet being uncircumcised. What was the purpose of the circumcision? It was, it was a seal that's good. that you're saved forever, yeah. that, he, that, he, that he has righteousness. It's never changing. I mean, it's permanent. There's no changing that. And <clears throat> look at verse number 12. Well, let's finish reading the last part of that. That righteousness <coughs> might be imputed unto them also. Actually, I think we didn't read that last phrase either. We'll go ahead and read the whole verse again just to be safe. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had. So he had that righteousness, it said, which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe. Notice that, that he might be the father of all them that believe. Watch this. Though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. Think about this. <clears throat> if Abraham, Brother Elliot and I were talking about this as well, if Abraham 
is going to be the father of the circumcision and the uncircumcision, which is why Paul, who's circumcised, speaks to the Romans and says, our father, right? Right before he goes into this concept. So he's, he's the father of the circumcision and the uncircumcision physically we're talking about right now, right? How is that possible? Because when he believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, he was what? Uncircumcised, right? When he believed in God, he was saved, and then he was circumcised afterwards. So he, he, he was both. He was given the promise, and he was in, and he was in circumcision when he was saved, and he was in uncircumcision when he was saved. Both. So he's able to relate to both, and therefore be the father of both. If he couldn't relate to being, let's say that you know he never was circumcised. That's what he's explaining. That's the way in which he is the father of the circumcision and also the uncircumcision. Look at verse number twelve. And the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only. Why? Because he, when he says the father of circumcision, because it's spiritual. To them who are not of the circumcision only, but watch this, he explains it. But who also walk in the steps of that faith. That faith of our father <coughs> Abraham, which he had being yet uncircumcised. So it even repeats it again. He had that faith, he had that righteousness being yet uncircumcised. Verse 13. For the promise that he should be the <coughs> heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law. Now, when he says through the law, he's talking about circumcision. Circumcision was a part of the law. When the law was given, it was a part of the law, and it was, it was a commandment, right, that was given to Abraham, and it was a work that he had to do, right? It's a part of the law is the commandment that was given to him. So he's saying it wasn't through the law. The promise wasn't given. What identified someone as a Jew oftentimes in the Old Testament is what the same thing of what he keeps identifying them now as being circumcised. When you wanted to be, when it says they became Jews and Esther, what do you think they did? Yeah, they became circumcised, right? So when it's saying right here, doing those types of things, being circumcised and keeping the law, that's not what the promise was given to him for. It was given through faith. And he said, and it, and it says, <coughs> so it wasn't given to Abraham and to his seed through the law, he says, but through the righteousness of faith. Think about this right here. This is this again, hyper dispensationalism, it just crumbles it. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of none effect. Think about that for a minute. He's saying if anyone. If anyone is able to be saved or to be of that seed, right? Because people say that promise that was given to Abraham, to his seed, they will try to separate that promise. And they try to apply that promise to who all the time? Physical Israel, right? And what is physical Israel trusting in, right? In the Bible, a lot of them don't even take it serious. But an Orthodox Jew would say the Torah. That's what they always make a big deal about, right? The law. First five books and specifically the commandments, right? That's what they would say. Well, right here it's saying that anyone, if anyone, for if they which are of the law, they which are of the circumcision, that it's by working. That's what he's speaking about right now. Keeping the law in order to be of the seed, he says, then faith is made void. Then, then faith is made void. Again, these two things can't, can't coexist. He says, and the promise in, in this case would be made of none effect. If people of the law... We're able to be a part of that same seed, then, then faith is made void. It wouldn't even matter. Watch what he says, verse 15. This is a continuous thought to verse 16, and then it concludes. Because the law worketh wrath, for where no for where no law is, there is no transgression. When he says worketh there, it's kind of like propagates or produces. He's saying the law produces wrath. It's going to bring about wrath. Why? Because you're going to break the law. Because he says right after that, for where no law is. There is no trans transgression. He's saying when there's the law, there's transgression. It means you're breaking the law. And then what does transgression bring? Wrath. He's saying worketh means brings about in that process. Law, transgression, wrath. Verse 16 ties back in with verse 14. Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace. So when he's saying of faith in verse 14, he's really talking about grace, right? Right there, because he says the whole reason that it's by faith, which is so stupid, hyper dispensationalists say, oh, it's by it's 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 uh, faith and works. The whole reason it's of faith is so that it can be by grace, and you can't have grace and works. Think about that for a minute. 
It says, therefore, it is of faith that for this reason, it might be by grace. Why is it by faith? Why is salvation by faith? So that it could be by grace. So that you're not having to work for it. So that it's something that you don't have to physically do and then trust in yourself. That's the whole reason. Why did God choose faith? So that he could freely offer you a gift. Think about that for a minute. What's the reason why salvation is through the medium of faith? So that you just wouldn't have to do anything. It's the only way that you just wouldn't have to do anything. It's just a physical, you know, or just a, a, a mental trust in your mind. Just in your mind, you just choose to trust without doing anything at all, right? And people say, well, the Old Testament was by faith and works. What? The whole reason God said that it was by faith is so that it could be by grace. Or it was of faith that said that it could be by grace. So when he says in verse 14, for if they which are of the law be, <coughs> be heirs, faith is made void. Why is faith made void? Because faith, the whole reason it's by faith is of grace. And if it's of, if it's of works, then, then uh, faith is void. You understand? Because grace is void. That's what he's saying. One voids the other. If you want to work for it, guess what? Grace and faith are voided. If you want to just trust in Jesus, well then, then works have to be voided. It's one or the other. And it will make it void. And if anyone was ever to be able to be an heir here, if, for if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of none effect. Why? Because a promise, that's what a promise is. A promise is... Look at verse 17 is where it actually talks about that. Oh, no, no, no. I think we didn't finish it. Yeah, verse 16. It's in verse 16. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace. Watch this. To the end, the promise might be sure. Notice that. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, <coughs> but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. If you look at like Titus 1-2, <coughs> The way that God can promise us eternal life, and it can be a promise in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began, is because he can say, if you believe on me, you'll have eternal life. That's how it's a promise. So that's why it would be made void in that sense. So he says he made it by faith, of faith so that it might be by grace, and he says to the end the promise might be sure. That's also teaching eternal security there. So that it can be sure. And he says, to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but, that, but, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham. Watch this. Who is the father of us all. Saying both. That's why I refers to him again, Romans 4, 1, as our father. Verse 17. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. And you know, in the Old Testament, <coughs> right when you're a new Christian, you're reading it, you might read over that. I've made you a father of many nations. Because what do you always hear? Abraham's the father of the Jews, right? But that's not what that promise meant. Yes, it, it was a specific seed that would become that would come of the Jews, but it was only given to that one seed, right? And through that one seed, all nations would basically be in Christ, right? Of all nations in blood, and then who is his father? Who is Christ's father? You know, great, 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 great father. You know, as far as his seed came down from Mary. Obviously not his physical father. God was his father. Right. Abraham, right? right? He came down through the seed of Abraham from Mary. So if we're in Christ, then who's our father? Who did we descend from in that spiritual sense? <laughs> Abraham. That's how he's the father of us all, right? right? Being in Christ in that sense, through faith. So it says here, so there was obviously that lineage that would go back of his. Obviously, there was a physical seed of his that would one day come. We know that. But then he says there, as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed. Talking about God. Then he tells you, even God who quickeneth the dead. Right? He raises the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. <coughs> now, it's interesting here. He says, who quickeneth the dead. Keep that, that thought in your mind. Look at verse 18. Who against hope believed in hope. Now, a lot of people have misunderstanding of what this verse is saying. What he's saying here, and it, it, it is sometimes some of the wordings in the King James Bible can be a little bit difficult sometimes. When he's saying who against hope, it's basically another way of saying when things were hopeless. Who against hope, when, when it felt like there was no hope, believed in hope. Even when the situation was hopeless, why? He's going to explain it to you just to prove that. Who against hope believed in hope that he might be the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. 
He says, and being not weak in faith, watch, he considered not his own body now dead. When he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He's saying that this is a hopeless situation. He, he is physically, if you were able you know, to have a doctor look at that guy, I bet he would tell you, you know, he's, 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 not, he's probably not able to have children. You look at Sarah. Pro, you know, she's 100%. She's not able to have kids. You know what I mean? It's a hopeless situation. It's against hope. But he believed in hope anyways. And it, so it says there, when he was about 100 years old at the end of verse 19, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. I mean, think about that, though. That is a powerful situation. God comes to him. He's 100 years old. You know, I'm not real familiar with it, but I know there's something called menopause. And once that's over, I'm pretty sure you can't have kids, right? I'm sure Abraham was aware of that. So he's, in his mind, he's like, we just can't have kids. God comes to him and he's like, you're going to have a child. I mean, and, and Abraham believed it. He knew, I'm going to have a child. I mean, think about that. That's a cool, I mean, to see someone else's faith in a situation where it looks physically impossible. The only person that could pull that off would be the person that created the world in the first place, right? right. The person that created that body. He can reverse, he can change anything that he wants, Right? And, and you know, he can quicken the dead. That's what that's referring to. I almost forgot the reference that. When it's talking about him that quickens the dead, he's referring to the fact, and, and I don't know if anyone's ever thought of this, but but Sarah and Abraham is a perfect picture of Mary. Sarah is not physically able to have children, right? Was it physically possible for Mary to have a child when she did? She was a virgin. She probably, it was cap she was capable, obviously, because she had other kids. But... The, the conception that took place was impossible, right? She was a virgin. And then what happened with Sarah? She had a child. And, and what was that child? It was Isaac who was representative of who? Christ. Mary, what? Brought forth Christ. That seed. That, it's a picture of everything. You say, everything? Everything in the Bible is a picture of Jesus. Everything in the Bible is. It's amazing. When you just keep studying the Bible, everything in the Bible points you to Jesus. Look at the next passage. So it says in verse 20, He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, <coughs> giving glory to God. It's interesting that it says that right there, giving glory to God. <coughs> verse number 20, because uh, verse number 1 was the passage that says, He hath whereof to glory, but not before God. So did he glory about his own works before God? He didn't, but what did he glory about? Right? He gloried about what God was able to do. Right? He had faith in what God was able to do, and he would glory through God because God was going to bring about this miracle. But he didn't glory in something he did himself. Right? So you can see those two comparisons. When it tells you that he didn't, and then you see what he did do, they line up perfectly. He says, He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. I read that because I wanted to read it in context with verse 21 right here. Watch this. And being fully persuaded that when he had promised, he was able also to perform, and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now, a lot of people will look at this passage and they they <coughs> they will say, well, you know what he did? <coughs> he did actually stagger at the promise. You're right, later on. But when he gave him that promise, then the Bible tells you he was fully persuaded at that moment. Fully persuaded. You know why? Because salvation is not this continual, you got to keep the faith. You know, that's supposedly free will Baptist. They supposedly say, and that's not true, but they say, we don't believe that salvation is by works at all, but we do believe that you can lose your salvation because if you stop having faith, you lose your salvation because we're saved by faith. And that's not true. Amen. Because I... When I, was, when I was young, about six, seven years ago probably, much younger in the ministry, a guy invited me to a church. And I was going to – I went to every Sunday I, after church. My dad still carries on the same ministry now because I gave it to him when I left last time. I would go to a nursing home. There was a guy that would come there, and he, and he would come and preach there too. And he's like, hey, man, come. You're, yeah, you're a good preacher. Come preach at my church tonight. I'm like, cool, man. I show up, there's like seven people there. I didn't know how many people were going to be there. But it was a free will Baptist church. And I preached a message on, I preached anyway, but let me preach. Who cares, right? I was a real funny part of that, too. It was, it was, on, it was live on like this. Did I tell you about this or something? It was live on like the local 
TV thing, uh, right around that area. I don't know what the channel is, but it's like, you know, the state stuff in that area, the government channels. And he's like, preach 20 minutes. Well, I wasn't watching the clock. And, and I don't know how long he was doing this, but I looked up and he was like, cut it off. I don't know how far I was over. I wasn't paying attention to the time at all. But he got up afterwards, and, and I knew what Free Will Baptists believe. He got up afterwards and he talked about, because I talked about eternal security. And he got up after me and talked about losing your salvation. And what do you think he said? If you stop believing, what do you think he said? You can't just believe in Jesus and live however you want. Like, you're a stinking liar. It always falls back to work salvation. Seriously. Always falls back to work salvation. You believe, if you believe, if you're saved, you're saved and you understand the gospel and you know that it's by faith. This is my point. That's what this passage proves. Because he did stagger. He did stagger, right? Why did he? He has another son whose name was what? Ishmael. And why? Because he staggered, right? His wife told him, "I'm not. I'm not having a child. God's obviously not going to do. We got to have a child, right? Have one through my servant Hagar." And he went and did it. So you tell me he wasn't staggering? He did stagger later on, but guess what? At that moment, he was fully persuaded. If we believe not, yet he abided faithful. Amen. He cannot Amen. deny himself. If you put your faith in Jesus, it doesn't matter. You can stagger later. You shouldn't. You know, you should you you should keep all the commandments. But if you don't, it doesn't matter. Amen. You're saved, you're sealed. You have the seal of the righteousness of the faith, right? Which he had yet being uncircumcised, and that's irreversible. Right. If you think about that, there's nothing changing that. Abraham already had that. Think about that. He just got done explaining that in this context. That seal was to show him you're sealed. You know, you're, you're, that seal was to show him you're saved. And it's never changing. So even when he staggered, guess what? Did the seal go away? No. Never going away. So guess what? You're, you're still righteous. Still righteous. Yeah. It doesn't matter. He, yeah, he staggered later, but at the moment when he came to him, he considered not his own body dead, right? Neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb, right? It says in verse 22, and therefore it was <coughs> imputed to him for righteousness. So for that reason, at the moment he came to because when did he receive righteousness? Further proof of that. When did he receive the righteousness? Genesis 15, right when he came to him. Not later. It says, and therefore, because he was fully persuaded, when? In Genesis 15. Therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. He was saved and sealed right then. That was just that was just a, a visual of the seal. It was a physical, you know, manifestation of the seal, which he already had, yet being uncircumcised. Uh, right? And then it says this now it was not written for his sake alone. So these things just weren't written for him, just so that he could learn from it, that it was imputed to him, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him, watch this. That raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. Notice the pattern where he's talking about quickening the dead and then her womb being dead. So what's he tying in? Talking about how Isaac was able to come out of a situation, right? And then he even ties it in with Jesus being given life, even in, in the resurrection. If we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. So he parallels those two things, right? And then he says, who was delivered for our offenses, our sins, and offenses like a sin or a transgression, our, when we offended God <coughs> and was raised again, watch, for our justification. So these things weren't only written to Abraham because it's the same gospel for Abraham as it is for me. Amen. It's the same gospel for Abraham as it was for David. It's the same gospel for David as it is for me, as it is for Abraham. You can... You could web that to every person that's ever lived. Jew, that's why it's important to understand. Jew is physical Jew, and then Gentile is every person outside of that. So guess what? To all. Every single person, period. Amen. Salvation is the same for everybody. There's one gospel. It's never changed. In Romans 4, if, if you bump into a hyper-dispensationalist, this is the best place to take them. You know? Romans chapter 4 just demolishes. I was telling Brother Elliot this too. Before this, we talk a lot. That's why I keep referencing. I was telling Brother Elliot this too. <coughs> What's interesting is, think about this. Do you think that Paul was dealing with hyper? He wasn't trying to prove hyper dispensationalism wrong in this passage, right? That's not what he's dealing with. He's just trying to prove that salvation is by faith, right? He doesn't even have to worry about people trying to say to him, "Well, that's a different dispensation." He just quotes a scripture from the Old Testament just to prove that salvation is by faith. Just in general. 
No one just, you have to be taught that by man, is my point. You have to already think salvation is different in the Old Testament. He's just like, oh, you, you know, you want to prove that salvation is by faith? Abraham believed God and was counted him for righteousness. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. He's like, you want me to prove to you that salvation is by faith? Even as David also described it, the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputed for righteousness without work, saying, blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. I think I missed the part there, but yeah. He, he doesn't have to, because hyper is man-made. That's why. And you have to already have that preconceived idea when you go to read the Bible. I like, I like how, how Paul teaches them something and then he keeps those things along. He defines circumcision and uncircumcision, right? He talks about how the wrath of God, how we're all sinners, and he references being ungodly, right? He, he, he teaches them something and then he builds upon it. He doesn't just like baby them. He teaches them, now you know that you're the real circumcision? Well, our father Abraham. You get what I'm saying? He, and he doesn't explain it when he says it. So he, he teaches them all these different foundational things, and then he just keeps you know, feeding it to them as it's going. He keeps adding to it is what I'm saying. He'll, he'll, he'll tell them one time, and then he'll reference that same thing or even use that same language repeatedly. You know why? Because God expects you to grow. That's why he doesn't expect to have to keep telling you the same things over and over again. He wants you to want to learn. He wants you to have a mind where you're listening, you're paying attention, you're wanting to learn the Bible, and you're growing. You're not saying with the basic principles, right? It talks about in Hebrews 6. We're, we're learning and we're growing. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father God, we thank you for this day, dear Lord. We thank you how, <coughs> how clear your word is. We thank you that... And we have the, that you gave us the great example of Abraham, dear Lord God. <laughs> and that even though we are, you know, Gentiles, dear God, that you have allowed us, dear Lord, to have uh, the, that same blessedness. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask you that you be with us and just bless this church. Continue to bless this church. Help us to get the work done this week uh, that we need to, dear Lord God. And uh, just keep us safe. Bless all of our families. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. amen.